All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, hopefully everyone's got your isometric paper. Uh, today, we are going to start drawing. We'll have three lectures on engineering drawing and two tutorials, or two and a half technically. Um, and hopefully by the end of that, you guys will be pretty comfortable doing hand drawings, which should complement the SolidWorks drawings that you're doing in the workshops. So obviously everyone's getting pretty comfortable doing front view, side view, top view, parts, dimensions, that sort of stuff in SolidWorks. Obviously there's theory related to that, and we're going to learn a bit of that drawing theory. And also you can't always whip SolidWorks out and get a quick SolidWorks drawing uh, when you're having like a kind of a brainstorming session or an engineering discussion. You need to be able to draw by hand and you need to be able to take a drawing from another engineer or a draftsman or someone else and be able to interpret that. That's probably the most important part of this section, right? Because oftentimes as an engineer, it won't be just you drawing something from scratch. It will be a client or a manager or some other engineer providing you with a very, very detailed set of drawings of some sort of a circumstance and you've got to design within that. So you might need to put a bit of plant machinery or something like that within and around other components. And so you need to be able to take the drawings you provided, interpret that and then do your, your design in the context of that. Okay, so it's really important that you guys understand technical drawings and that's everyone. Every discipline uses technical drawings to some extent or other. All right, so this is our class schedule. Is everyone keeping abreast of this? Everyone's paid attention to this? This is in the last page of the subject outline. I'm sticking to this almost to the letter, I think. I don't think I've deviated at all. We're there. So we're up to week seven, right? So this is lecture 11, engineering drawing one. We're going to have a drawing exercise in the tutorial tomorrow. And on whenever that is, Wednesday, we're going to talk about how you've actually gone in your project groups. Uh, and ways to improve group work such that for the next project, hopefully you can implement some of those changes. This audio seems to be a little bit loud for my liking. There we go. Um, and then next week we're going to do a little bit more on drawing and then you get lecture recess, okay? So uh, that's what we're doing for the rest of the semester. Pay attention to this, guys, because if you haven't been using this, this will tell you exactly what is in each lecture. Now, for tomorrow, um, hopefully everyone's got rulers and pens and pencils and so forth for today, because we're going to do some drawing stuff. Obviously, I've just given you the paper. Um, it's not going to be critical if you don't have your own ruler. I have a few here for people to borrow if need be today. But for tomorrow's tutorial, you will be assessed on how well you do your drawing, and you will need that kind of stuff. Okay, so if you rock up without the ability to draw, you will not do well in the tutorial tomorrow. All right, and it's an individual task as well tomorrow, so everyone needs to contribute their own drawing. All right. Okay, so as everyone gets their rulers and pens out, uh, the last thing I want to talk about just in this kind of introduction to today's lecture, or this week's, this week's and next week's lecture, is that we're squarely in subject learning outcome seven there which is develop practical experience with pictorial communication skills. That includes sketching, technical hand drawing, and commercial engineering solid modelling. So obviously commercial engineering solid modelling is your solid works. We'll talk about sketching and we'll talk about technical hand drawing. Okay, so that's what we're doing this week and next week. All right, so there's a little bit of a definition that I just pulled off Wikipedia. You'll see my nice Wikipedia reference at the bottom there, indicating that I didn't plagiarise it. Um, engineering drawing, the activity, produces engineering drawings, funnily enough, the documents. More than just the drawing of pictures, it is also a language. That's perhaps the most important part. A graphical language that communicates ideas and information from one mind to another. Right, drawing's not just for shits and giggles, it's actually got a purpose. Okay? Most especially it communicates all needed information from the engineer who designed the part to the workers who will make it. All right? And that can be those that are actually making it if you're producing manufacturing drawings or you could interpret that as one engineer to another engineer who's doing a different component. Or uh, you could have architects that are bringing technical drawings to you guys as civil engineers um, such that you get migraine headaches, um, which is the general exchange between architects and civil engineers. 
Um, but basically, there's going to be someone giving you drawings, and you're going to be giving someone else drawings, and you need to work it out. All right. It is pictorial communication. So it is nothing other than communication between engineers. If you interpret it as communication, then you understand that it has to have things in it that actually communicate what you're trying to say. And as soon as you look at a picture from the perspective of communication, you can hopefully identify what's missing. All right? It's very important that the information that you want to convey is in that drawing. And if it's not, it's not doing its job. All right? And there's different forms of pictorial communication that I have here. Um, the first one, and the one that probably all of you have done this semester already, is sharing ideas during the design process. So during that brainstorming process, what does the bridge look like? What's your suggestion for the structure of the bridge? What type of bridge structure are you going to use? How big is it? What sort of material? Little comments of, this is made out of balsa wood, this is made out of steel, this is glued that kind of stuff. So you guys will have already in your groups been doing drawing and sketches and that kind of stuff talking to one another. That's an incredibly important part of the design process and if you're reluctant to do drawing you're going to spend four times longer brainstorming than you would if you're quickly able to draw little sketches that mean things to other people. All right, So that's one mode of communication. Um, design details in reports, records or correspondence. Obviously you need to document your designs. Um, assembly detail in reports and so forth. So that's you writing reports and communicating what the design is, but that's just to a general audience. Okay, So that's to perhaps other engineers and managers and that kind of stuff. What is the design? What's involved in it? What's it made out of? That kind of stuff. And then I've got manufacturing drawings. What do you reckon the difference to, between a report drawing and a manufacturing drawing is? Yeah, so where it fits in the assembly, that's going to be important in manufacturing, particularly in the assembly phase of manufacturing. What else? Tolerances. Tolerances. That's a good one. So when someone actually goes to machine a component that you've designed and you say it's 20 mils in diameter, when you're working on a lathe, you generally can't hit exactly 20 mils. Or you can if you're a very good tradesman and you spend a shitload of time trying to get there. But to get that 20 mils, you get to 21 mils and you get a vernier caliper or a micrometer out. You get to 20.5 mils. You get to 20.05 mils. You get to 20.01. And every time they take a tiny little bit of material off, and then they have to check it again, and a tiny little bit of material, and then they check it again. So if you want something exact, it's going to take a tradesman a really, really long time to do it. If you don't care, it's going to take a tradesman very little amount of time to do it. And guess what the price difference is between someone taking 15 minutes and someone taking four hours? Whatever four hours divided by 15 is. That's basically the price difference. All right? These guys are working for what you're paying, $150 an hour, maybe $500 an hour, depending on whether they're good or not. So it's a huge difference as to how accurate you want. And if you just give someone a drawing that says 20 millimetres, they'll go, all right. I've got nothing else to do today, and they'll do it. But then you'll get a very, very large bill, all right? So you need to be able to communicate those type of features in a manufacturing drawing. How detailed is it? How are you going to manufacture it? When you get to third and fourth year, if you're in mechanical engineering, you'll actually be specifying manufacturing processes. And first we use the CNC and we cut these bits off, and then we put it in the lathe and you cut those bits off and do that kind of stuff as well. So actual sequence of manufacturing needs to be communicated there. Lots of notes and comments on the drawing. Please use this type of steel. Please use this type of tap. This tolerance is required. That kind of stuff. So the sorts of drawings you have in a report are very general, but once you go to manufacturing, you need all of those specific details. All right? And there's a very standardised way that you put those in there such that the tradesmen aren't looking at your drawing trying to sift through it and work out where you've written something important. All right, so you've got to adhere to standards when you do that. And the last one, use in operational manuals and maintenance documents. So if you've got assembly drawings and things like that and you've got a car and someone is now a mechanic and they're trying to drop the engine out of it, you need to actually put all of that information in that manual, otherwise no one's going to have any idea how to do anything. And now that's, for mass-produced stuff, it's obviously very important, but it's also important if you've just, you know, updated something in a miner or a refinery or something like that, bit of equipment, and someone's got to maintain it and check it in a month to make sure it's not destroying itself. 
you're going to need manuals there to be able to do that and you can put drawings in that manual. So there's actually lots of different areas where technical drawings are very, very important for engineering. Okay? Now, the references I'm giving you are largely mechanical because I'm a mechanical engineer, but civil engineers use drawings just as much. Chemical engineers use process drawings, and chemical engineers will also have to understand a lot of the drawings the mechs produce because they're actually, generally speaking, a chemical engineer who's managing a process has a lot of mechs and civils and things under them. All right, so you need to understand that kind of stuff. Electrical engineers have circuits and that kind of stuff, but you'll also have to be you know, putting those circuits into housings and understanding the housing manufacturer and that kind of stuff. So everyone does drawings. Mechs do probably more than anyone, um, but everyone needs to be able to communicate with one another about this sort of stuff. All right, so today we're going to do 3D drawing. Um, I'm largely going to focus on isometric which is a type of axonometric projection, and I'll talk about that. But we'll also talk about oblique and perspective, and then next week we'll do sketching. I'll talk about the Australian standard for drawing. There's an Australian standard that says exactly how your drawings need to be configured, and if you don't adhere to it, then most of the time people won't pay attention to it. Um, and then we'll talk about 2D drawing, so projection stuff, like what you've been doing for SolarWorks. So, for the workshop that you've got currently, you're doing your bridge. You've got a shaded isometric, that's what we're doing today by hand, all right? And you've got the top view, the front view and the side view with dimensions and so forth, that's what we're doing next week by hand, okay? So that's roughly where we're sitting. All right. Who knows what orthographic projection is? Show of hands. Who's done any drawing before and understands what isometric is? All right, so roughly maybe a third, if not a half. Great. Um, for some of you, this might be very, very revisional, and for some of you, this will be brand new. This is roughly how we do drawings, okay? We have a box, we put stuff in the box, and then we draw what we see on each of the windows. These are viewports, okay? And then, so if I'm doing uh, front view, side view, top view, like what you need to do for your SolidWorks, I'll put this and my planes will be parallel to the viewport planes. I'll look through there and I'll draw what I see. What do I see through that window? A square, yeah. I'll draw a square. I look down, I see a square. Look over, I see a square. And then I do that. And that's what you actually produce in your SolarWorks drawing or whatever. It's just what you see from each side, it's just basically the viewports folded out. So that's the easiest way to interpret that. I'll talk more about that when we do 2D next week. Now that's kind of oblique projection. Axonomeric projection, now you remember when I said this, this plane is completely parallel to that front surface, right? So I only see a box. I don't see the sides, I don't see the corners, I just see the front face. Axonomeric projection is any time I twist that around and I see more than two faces through the one viewport. All right, so now if I've got that at the side like that, if everyone can see, if I look through that front viewport, I can see two sides of that cube. So if I can see two sides of that cube, that's an axonomeric projection, technically. Now if I was to rotate that up, now it's a little bit difficult to hold in the air when I do it, but let's rotate that up. Now I can see the top, I can see the left side, and I can see the right side all simultaneously on my cube like that or forward, whichever way I want to go. All right? And the way that I actually rotate that gives me more information. Why do you think we have 3D drawings? Why do we use 3D drawings? Why don't we do everything in front view, top view, side view? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, e it's more easily interpreted. You get a better understanding looking at a 3D drawing, particularly if you have a 3D drawing there and you have a bunch of 2D drawings with dimensions, Sometimes looking at the top view, side view, and left view of a box, it's, you know, what, what am I looking at? Is there any other detail I'm missing? But you look at a 3D and it's really clear what it is, right? So the 3D gives you that good, easily interpreted information because we live in 3D, so we look at that stuff every day. Whereas front view, top view, side view takes some experience to actually interpret what you're looking at and visualise the 3D shape. You guys need to start getting comfortable with 3D visualisation and it's not something that comes naturally. So I can look at a 2D shape or a 2D drawing, front view, top view, side view, whatever, 
and I can in my brain visualise what the 3D part looks like. Now, if you're not comfortable doing that, that's the sort of thing you need to start practicing, and we're going to do that in some of these isometric drawings. Right? Taking the 2D, converting it into a 3D drawing, because if you can do that, you can start communicating very easily with this type of stuff. All right, so axonomeric just means more than one axis showing, effectively. Now, there's a few different types of axonomeric. So I mentioned isometric before. Some of you were familiar with isometric, maybe a third of the class. Isometric, um, I'll talk about it probably on the next drawing, it's probably easier. So this is isometric. We've got a few different options, isometric, diametric, and trimetric. Has anyone seen these options in SolarWorks? Yeah? So when you do one of these 3D drawings, you've got an option to do isometric, diametric, or trimetric. Okay? And the name suggests ISO 1, die, 2, try, 3, right? And what that actually means is if we can see this drawing here, isometric, as I rotate this up, I rotate it up to the point where my bottom edges, this edge here, and the horizontal, when that projects to the front plane, that makes a 30 degree angle. All right, can everyone see that? And that 30 degree angle is this angle here. And if I do that, and the other side's a 30 degree angle, what that means is my point, the point that points at the viewer, alpha, alpha, and alpha, they're all the same angle, 120 degrees. ISO, one, one angle for each of those three places. Okay? So that's an isometric. And if this box is one by one by one, and I drew it on this drawing, if I projected that to the front viewport, and actually measured physically on this. So if I was to draw this, let's say I draw this on my front here, angle up, and that'd be nice if I had a pen that worked. Angle up, angle up, up, down, up, back. All right, so that's what I'm seeing if I do that. If this is a dimension of one, one millimetre, one centimetre, one inch, whatever, and I actually physically got my ruler out, which just for illustration purposes, let's say I'll get my ruler out, and measured this and said that that was one. That's a drawing, all right? That's actually not what the projection would be. If I projected all of those points forward, it wouldn't be one on the flat face because it's on an angle. It's angle, angled to the actual plane. So this one actually decreases when I rotate around to the front place. But it's just a lot easier to say, that measurement's one, so let's just draw one on the front face. It's heaps easier to draw that, all right? Because we just get the ruler out and say, how big is it? That's what I draw on the page. That's called an isometric drawing. That's my first one here. And one on this equals one on the drawing plane. An isometric projection is literally what you are measuring. So if I projected all of those points exactly forward, this one, because it's at an angle to the viewport, actually isn't one anymore. It's shorter than one by whatever the trigonometry says it needs to be. And for isometric drawing, that's 0.816 in each of the three directions. So if this is one by one by one, I draw a box that's 0.816 by 0.816 by 0.816, and that would be a perfect isometric projection because you're projecting it rather than just drawing it. Now, obviously, that's a gigantic pain in the bum because 0.81 times crazy little details and things like that takes forever to draw. If you've got SolarWorks, it's really easy. It just does it automatically for you. But if you're doing it on a page, most of the time what I'll be expecting is an isometric drawing from you. Is everyone comfortable with the distinction between the two? Yeah? If I asked you that in a question, in a quiz, you would be able to tell me the difference between the two. Remember that. Yeah? All right. Diametric. So isometric, that 120 is for all three of those angles, so one angle distributed across three. Diametric means that two of those angles are the same and one is different. So you could have a 20 degree and a 20 degree, which means alpha is 110 and 110 and beta is 140. So you've got two angles that are the same, one angle that's different, or two independent angles, effectively. Or you could tilt it on its side like this one, my cursor's showing, isn't it? And you could have 15 and 60, and then alpha and alpha is 105, and beta is 150, like that. Both of those are diametric, and that's fine. 
SolidWorks just chooses a plane that works for Diametrics and just uses those angles. I don't think there's a setting that you can change it, but there might be. You can always rotate it around yourself manually. And then Triometric, so Diametric, we have two independent angles. Triometric, each of those three is completely different. So an example would be 10 and 50 gives us 100, 120 and 140, all right? So three different angles. It's just a slightly different rotation. All it's really meaning is that this is just rotated a little bit differently, but those are the rules around isometric, diametric, and trimetric. All right, that's the theory. That's it. That's all you need to know about those. Why? Oh, the other thing is, obviously, you can have projection versions and you can have drawing versions. Drawing versions is one-to-one. -one. Projection is whatever the hell the complex trigonometry tells you that length needs to be. We won't even worry about that, right? The reason that we worry about diametric and trimetric, some of you might have seen with the isometric stuff, is an isometric drawing on the left there, because everything's at 30 degrees, sometimes lines actually kind of superimpose on one another, and it becomes really difficult to see what's going on. And so oftentimes, if that's a, a situation that you're coming across, just twisting it a little bit by choosing diametric or trimetric instead, instead will give you a lot more information for the one drawing. Better communication, right? So if you're getting those lines lining up, and that's pretty common with isometric because everything's at 30, just use a diametric or a trimetric and it'll tell you what you need to know. Okay? All right, so how do we draw? Everyone's got a page. We're going to be talking about the 30 degree isometric standard drawing, all right? So whenever I say draw an isometric, unless I specifically say the word projection, I expect whatever the measurements that you read to be, to be one as to one on the page. You'll see this example here. That little box in the top there is one, two, three, four, five, six wide. And you'll see each one of those little triangles is half of one of those, so there'll be one, two, three, four, five, six. No, each one of those triangles is one of those, so that's six wide. Yeah? So one is to one, even though it's, you know, it's not actually going to be that if you projected it properly. All right. Who thinks I hold the paper up like this? Look at your paper and see. Hold up if you think you hold the paper in, what's that, portrait? And that's landscape. Who thinks portrait? Paper in the air. Who thinks landscape? Paper in the air. All right, let's look again at your paper. Look at the angle that the lines go up on. So what you want with isometric, I'll go back to, let's say, this drawing. What you want with isometric is your horizontal line to be 30 degrees from the line that goes back left and right. So if I hold this in landscape, what angle are those lines at? They're 60 degrees. They're going up. Now, if I hold that this way, those lines are much closer to 30 degrees, yeah? I'm going to say this again because every single year I say that in this lecture and then I walk around the room and see people doing drawings this way, okay? Isometric is always 30 degrees up from the horizontal. If you don't know what 30 degrees is, 0 degrees, 90 degrees, Roughly 45 degrees, so 30 is less than that. So 30 is less than halfway up, right? 30 is just one third. So up 30, up 60, all the way to 90. All right? If you're uncomfortable with that, please go on Wikipedia and learn about angles. But hopefully it should all be okay. Um, so when you actually look at this, the horizontal... Now, we don't have horizontal lines drawn on this, which is probably what tricked you all. But... The horizontal will be horizontal, and then we draw up from that 30 degrees. So you have to hold this paper in portrait like this when you're drawing. Is everyone comfortable with that? Any further questions on that as to why? No? Isometric paper, always look at the diagonals and make sure they're 30 to the horizontal, even if the horizontal isn't drawn. Now, the horizontal is not drawn on this because how many horizontal lines are in that cube there? Zero. You've got vertical lines. Vertical stay vertical. One's back to the left, go up at 30 degrees that way. One's back to the right, go up 30 degrees that way, and that's it. So there's no horizontal lines on this because you never draw a horizontal line in isometric unless it's kind of weird. Cool. All right. The process for drawing an isometric drawing, and people get this wrong time and time again, even those that have done it in graphics before, 
box it out. Draw a big dirty box around whatever you're going to draw and draw in from that. Because effectively what you're drawing when you draw a box around something is my viewport here. Okay? So if I look at that top thing, it's kind of an L shape in one profile and it's kind of like got those angles on one bit and curves on one bit. If the first thing you start drawing is a circle or a curve or an angle, you're going to have a bad day. All right? You draw a box around it. Now, what is my dimensions? If, that's, if one of those boxes up the top there is one centimetre, how big should the box I draw around that be? You should be able to count. Just use your fingers. One, two, three, four, five, six, by one, two, three, four, five, six, by one, two, three, four, five, six. Everyone good with six by six by six. So what I do is I draw a box six by six by six in isometric and that's the first thing that I do. Alright, so this is now my viewport box, six by six by six. On the top viewport, I draw what's ever on the top. On the front viewport, or on the right-hand side, I draw whatever on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, I draw whatever's on the left-hand side. So if we look at the first drawing, I've got a 6x6x6 six 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 box. All right. What I draw on the top of this box here should be what's in the top view. And arbitrarily choosing whatever I draw on this side, we'll call the front view. Whatever I draw on this side will be the side view there. All right. So that's how you go from the oblique projection or the top front side view to the isometric. You just draw a box and you treat that as your viewport. All right? So step two is block in the details. And we're using pencil and we're doing it lightly so we can rub it out or draw in pen after the fact when we have a finished drawing. You draw it light and you just do really basic details and then get more complex. It's the number one rule for just about everything in engineering. Start simple work more complex. All right? So if we're boxing out the details, if we go on the top there, I've got this feature that's two down. So I go two down and draw that feature. And that's, that's as much as I need on that top view. Right hand side, it's kind of an L, two wide at the side by one wide there. So I just do exactly that, two wide by one wide. On the front here, I've got my front little step that's one wide and I draw it and I've got my box shape. Okay, really easy, but now you've got something you can draw on. It makes life a hell of a lot easier once you've got that to draw all of the complicated bits, which is what we do next. So next we add the details. So on this bottom little bit, I've got this kind of chopped out bit and I've got this curvy stuff. So I draw my curve and I'll talk about how to draw circles in isometric in a second. And I draw that curve and I draw that curve and I add little bits of lines. On the back face, same thing. On the back face there, I work out where my circle is and then I draw it. I work out what my diagonals are and I draw them. And then I have a mostly finished drawing. Last step, pen in the details or darken the lines. And if you like, you can rub out all your construction lines. It's generally good practice. And you'll have a really good quality isometric drawing. All right? This one, surprisingly, is very, very easy. It's got a few circles on it. So if you've never done isometric before, it might be a gigantic pain. But this one's very simple. But once we get very complicated ups and downs and different diagonal components and things like that, this process makes very complicated drawings still attainably easy. Okay? With drawing, if you follow the steps, it becomes much easier. Feel free to follow the steps. All right? So what you're drawing there is probably the simplest isometric you're ever going to draw that isn't a cube. But you can still put in to practice what I just said. Now, I'm going to want you to draw about three pictures on one side and then one picture on the other, maybe two and two. But So try and fit it as high up the top there as possible. One of the things that makes life really easy, or the reason that we box it out initially, is to actually work out that you can fit it on the page. Because if you start drawing part of it and then realise half of it's falling off the edge of the page, that's a problem and you've got to start again. You've just wasted heaps of time. So the act of drawing that box ensures that you're fitting on the page. Fit it up as high and as left as you can and then go from there. The measurements on those squares are 10 by 10 by 10. The measurements on these squares are 5 by 5 by 5, right? So if I say that that's, what is that, 6 wide, I'll need to go 12 little triangles wide on this. That's one small complexity that will make you think a little bit, okay? 
If you want a ruler, I have about 30 of them up here. You're welcome, first in, best dressed, to come and grab one. Now, I need these back at the end of the class, so don't steal my rulers, please. Alright, so you're drawing this. The first thing everyone's drawing is a box. How big is my box? Width. Six by height. Two by depth. Four. So everyone's drawing an isometric box. Six by two high by four. So you could probably go six up at 30 degrees to the left, four up at 30 degrees to the right, and two on your vertical, which is staying vertical. All right? And I'll even draw it to help. So, what did I say? Six this way. So that's going to be six. You don't need your dimension. That's going to be two. That's going to be four. And that joins up. And these angles, remember, are 30 degrees. Okay, so everyone should be boxed out by now. I said let's go back six, so I'll do that on my page here. If I want to start at the very top and I visualise that box, this is the point that I can get as high as is humanly possible and this is the point that I can get as left as is humanly possible. So if I want to get this as hard up against my edge as possible, not really important for this one, but would be important if you had a very large drawing so you don't want to start in the middle and realise you're off to the right of the page. So, my top will be up here somewhere and my left will be over there. It's got to be four, so... Can everyone see this? Let's say one, two, three, four, and I can go even higher than that, so here. One, two, three, four. Oh, that's a bit shiny and crap. Less shiny, but still crap. What is going on with that? That might be better. All right, so that's remembering that I need two triangles for each centimetre. So one, two, three, four, five, six that way. Box. Now I join up my box. Alright, I go one, two down. One, two down. One, two down. Now, if anyone's having com complex problems with the fact that I need two triangles to one square, you'll note, look at my ruler, it's exactly four centimetres on the ruler. This is to scale, so if you're given measurements, just make sure that your graph paper is to scale and you can just use your ruler to define what the size is. Alright, so there's my box. Everyone should have a box that looks like that. That size, that proportion, etc. Now we need to block in some details and obviously there's no fine details here so it's not a problem. What's the easiest plane on my top view, front view and inferred side view to draw? Top view, top view is easy. Excellent. Alright, so I've got a top view there. This is my top plane right there, and so I'm going to go, the back one is six by two down, three in, two down, right? Six by two in, by three in this way, one, two, three, is that right? No, no, one, two, there we go. Two that way, three in this way, one, two, three, and two down, one, two, and I draw that up. One, two. All right, so my top view is done. That's easy, right? 
Now, I've got a front view. What's in our front view? A straight down line on the front face. Easy. We do that. What's in my right view? I don't have a right view, but I can infer what's in the right view from the information that I'm given, which is obviously that this line joins down to the ground. Right, am I done? No. Obviously, if I was looking at a box, then there'd be some information in this area here, and it would be just that that line goes there, one there, one there. So I just fill that out as well. Technically, this line and this line are part of the right side view, and this line is part of the left side view, and now I have a completed isometric of that drawing. Is that easy for everyone? Hopefully it's easy for everyone. Obviously I'm starting really, really simple because some people have never seen isometric before. Those of you that have drawn houses in isometric in Year 12 graphics, obviously you'll be pretty straightforward with this. We'll get a little bit more complicated as we go along. Now, uh, as far as the drawings that you're doing goes, some people oftentimes are, are comfortable shading these in. For an engineering drawing, I prefer it not to be shaded. I prefer you not to shade one side to show that it's got depth and that kind of stuff. For engineering drawings, you generally don't shade stuff because you need to add dimensions and other stuff later on. Okay? Um, if you had a good set of coloured pencils, you could actually colour it in and that would be okay to sort of show it from the background. But for the most part, the way that you make that stand out is you use really light construction lines and you heavy up or pen your main lines, okay? That's as much as you want to do with this. You don't want to shade it too much, okay? All right. So, that's isometric. I'll talk more about isometric in a second. We'll do a little bit uh, more circles and lines and things. Who's heard of oblique cavalier or oblique cabinet? Some people? Thanks. Now, this is called oblique projection. This is not something that you could physically see if you held a box inside a viewport like this. There's no way to get those front edges perpendicular to the front plane and still have the other edges going back at 45 degrees, short of turning this into a very weird shape. All right? This is not a physical drawing. It is not a physical projection. What it is, is a hell of a lot easier to draw than isometric. Okay? If we look, then the front plane, and if we put our most complex geometry on the front plane perpendicular to the front viewport, we can just draw that as it's shown. One is to one, right angles, perfectly as is, a circle stays a circle, I don't have to draw trippy, isometric, oblique kind of oval shapes. It's easy, easy, easy to draw the front and then you just project everything back at 45 degrees and you draw the back perpendicular to the front plane as well. So, for example, we're going to draw an isometric cylinder in a second, but if I was to draw an isometric cylinder in oblique, I draw a perfect circle, lines back at 45 degrees, and a perfect circle. And obviously they're not perfect circles, it's a crap drawing because it's on a whiteboard. But, that was very, very quick, and I've now just drawn a shaft, right? And in ME2525, we do shaft design, so I do a lot of those. But it's really easy to draw something quickly in front of a person when you use that. Now, the main difference is oblique cavalier. One is to one is to one. If my box is one by one by one, then all three dimensions are one by one by one. And you can see that that looks a bit silly. Yeah? So that projects back into the page a little bit too far for what our eyes want to see. All right? It doesn't look like a cube to us. It looks more like a prism. All right? So if I want a cube... Over there on the right, oblique cabinet, the main difference or the only difference is one by one on the front plane and 50% scale going into the page. And you can see the way that your eyes work, the way that we actually work with perspective, that looks much more like a cube to us. Now, I mean, you could place the argument that somewhere in this 0.75 would look more like a cube to us, but still, that's the difference between those two things. The only reason that you might do half scale is because it looks a bit more realistic in a drawing. Okay? Is everyone good with that? Easy drawing. Uh, we might have a go in the tutorial at one of these or we might just skip that. This is largely just more for sketching. So we'll talk about that when we're doing sketching, I think. Uh, and this is perspective. Who's seen perspective drawing? Anyone done arts class before? 
Yeah, so probably more people seeing perspective than most other things. The main thing with perspective is that you always have a termination point on the horizon line. So look at my drawings here. So civil engineers probably need to know more about this than anyone else because oftentimes your architects and whatnot will be doing your projections and uh, your um, perspectives. This is the horizon line, right? That's the end of the world. Every single perspective drawing needs a horizon line. Where does the sky meet the ground? Okay? And then somewhere on that line you're going to be projecting back to. You've got a couple of options. One is you can put a point in the centre, and that's what I've got in this top one. And so this is how you would draw like a street with buildings down the side of it. And then every flat front face is just drawn perpendicular to the, the viewer. So you just draw rectangles as rectangles, circles as circles, whatever you want. That's just drawn perfectly in the front plane. And then every single point is projected back to that horizon point. All right? So I'd first draw my rectangle. I'd then take this point and project it back there, this point project it back there and so forth. And however deep down I want to go, whether it's like 0.45 like it was in Cavalier or whether it's some you know, value that I choose that looks good, I draw another point and then I draw my new vertical line. And if I was drawing hidden detail, I'd have a rectangle dat, 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 at the back there as well, but I'm not. Okay? So to do perspective, and perspective sometimes looks really nice on a, you know, a report or whatever. If you're designing a bridge, sometimes an isometric of that bridge might look a bit silly, but you could do a perspective, and SolarWorks gives you a perspective option as well, and that will look a lot nicer. Just understand that this is the basis for how that perspective works. This is the basis for our, how our eyes work. This is the most realistic drawing type because this is how your eyes actually interpret the world around you. So everything kind of terminates. So later today, if you go maybe out and just look down your street, just follow the lines of the houses as if you had a flat viewport and you were to draw it. Every single one of the lines that are parallel to each other, they don't look parallel, they look askew. And they actually terminate at a single horizon point. That's how we view the world. So this is the most realistic drawing because it's drawing how we actually view the world. And you can see this when you go out. Just get a pen and just hold it up against the building and you can see that the lines aren't parallel and that they actually terminate to a point. Pretty interesting if you've never done it before. Uh, the separate option is if I don't have a plane that's perpendicular to me. So if I have a plane that's perpendicular to me, all the other lines are parallel so they have to go down to the same point. If I have something at an angle, so it's askew like this, Obviously, these lines are parallel to each other and have to terminate at the same place, and these lines are parallel to one another and have to terminate at the same place, which means I need two places for them to go. All right? So I have two points on my horizon, one point there and one point there, and where you define them sort of depends on, you know, if you're just doing a sketch, you just choose it. Um, there's lots of arts rules to get it right if you're actually doing it properly. We don't teach you that because largely we don't mind too much about that. Uh, it's much more an architectural thing to understand this than engineering. But understand that there is a difference between perspective and different projection techniques that we use. Okay? So that's about as much as you need to understand about projection, um, or about perspective projection at least. Um, I just wanted to highlight it to you so you can actually interpret one of those drawings should you be given one. Uh, all right, what's next? Okay, fun stuff, right. All right, so... Everyone managed to punch out our little L shape in isometric pretty quickly there before without much initiation. Square shapes are pretty straightforward because we can draw boxes and we understand the idea of, you know, a box in a front view going onto a grid that's at an angle, but we can still interpret that pretty well. Um, diagonals, circles and curves are more complex to visualise in our mind. They're more complex to do. They're actually relatively straightforward if you still interpret life as a grid. So, if I have a top view that looks like that, and let's say this is one, that's three, this is one, that's three, and I have a diagonal line like that. 
That diagonal line is not parallel to any of my 30 degree angles, not the one left, not the one right, and it's not parallel to my vertical. It is off line with all of those. If I take that and translate that to a top plane, so 30 degrees back, 30 degrees back, actually, that'll probably be down, but let's say that's roughly my top and it might continue down, so I might have a front view down here or something. I need to draw that diagonal on my top plane there. And that top plane, remember if we're doing drawing, is one is to one, so I've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, three, four, and so that's technically my grid at the top there. That grid lines up perfectly, perfectly with this grid. So anything that hits a particular grid point in this one needs to hit the same grid point in this one. And I only need two points because it's a straight line and I join them up. So the two points I need are this one and this one. All right, so assuming I've laid it down flat, that's one back here and one up here. And then to get that diagonal, I connect them. Like so. And now, I was cleaning it up. And that might have some sort of a, you know, down, down, whatever. I've now drawn that in isometric very easily. All right, diagonals are a cinch if you just realise that all I care about diagonals is its two endpoints and where they are in relation to my box or how I've boxed it out or whatever, okay? Very straightforward. If I go back to the drawing example I gave before, this one, you see I have diagonals here. That diagonal there, if my cursor is showing, yes it is, is one box in and one box down. And when I come over here, I go one box in and one box down and just draw those two points up. Okay, really simple. All right, so diagonals are no more complicated than verticals. You just need to find the coordinates in your grid and go from there. Any questions on that? Simple? Yeah, great. All right, cool. All right, circles. Circles are kind of the same, yeah? It's still a grid system. It's just that because they're a continuous and curved shape, I can't just draw a single line. It's more complicated than that. But if I grid it up and pick either four points or potentially eight points on the grid in 2D, and translate that to the grid in 3D, then I'll get a circle as well. All right, so here's my box, and let's say that's, again, four by four. And within that, I have a circle. And let's look at the features of this circle inside that grid. That circle intersects with this point, this point, this point, and this point. Is everyone confident finding those four points in an isometric version of this grid? Yes? Everyone good with that? You can find four points, you can draw a circle. All right? But let's look at a couple more features of this circle so that our circle doesn't look like crap because it's really easy to draw really, really shitty circles in isometric. Now, if this was a uh, well-drawn circle, we'd work out that at this point, that circle is perfectly tangential to that line. It's perfectly horizontal and then continues on down there. It's perfectly horizontal to that, or perfectly, sorry, tangential to that, and perfectly tangential there. So there's a section of this circle that actually lines up perfectly with that grid, and that's one feature that we're going to translate to our isometric drawing as well. All right, so at those four points, not only does our circle go through those points, but it's tangential to whatever angle that grid is at those points. So let's draw our isometric. Let's say we're drawing it on top. And I'll draw my grid on there. Right, so we pick our four points. One, two, three, four. That was rule one, is that all four of those, the circle has to go through. Rule two is that our circle 
is tangential there, tangential there, tangential there, and tangential there. So that's already, I've drawn four little segments of my circle. All right? Now, I am completely happy, given that this subject is not a graphic subject, it is an engineering design subject, I am happy for you to draw the circle from here. If you want to be more accurate, what you do is find the location of perhaps that point and that point, or a location in terms of the grid, how far in, how far down, using trigonometry or whatever you know about circles. And if you find that extra grid point, you can plot it up here and have an extra point that that circle goes through, and here, and have an extra circle point, and here, and have an extra circle point, and so forth. Or those of you that know graphics, there's a technique that you can use with diagonals and all that kind of stuff, pretty much similar thing, right? So you can either start with four points or you can go through the eight points, but the main thing is that circle's tangential here. All right, drawing technique. Who knows how to draw a circle? Where is your wrist in relation to where the circle is? Does anyone know? Is it easy to draw a circle like this? Or is it easier like this? Your wrist is a pivot point. It makes a hell of a lot easier to draw a circle if that pivot point's at the centre of the circle. If you're trying to do this on your page, you're going to have a really wonky looking circle. Yeah? It's real simple stuff, but it's the stuff that you learn when you're actually doing this stuff a lot. right? So when I'm drawing a circle, my wrist is effectively the centre of the circle and it's a lot easier to get a nice curve. And sometimes you shift your page around and keep going. right? So, Wrist goes in the centre, I start at one of my points, I go off at the trajectory of this tangent and I draw around and meet up at the tra trajectory of that tangent. Alright? Question? Yeah, how are you using the compass? Not in isometric. Oh, okay. No, in isometric compass doesn't work because compass only really draws circles. Oh, yeah? yeah. yeah? Um, and I'll show you, once we actually go this tangent to this tangent and this tangent to this tangent and this tangent to this tangent. Obviously, my grid's a bit out. And now I have an isometric circle, which kind of looks like a circle, but it's actually much more elongated and egg-shaped if I was drawing this on a grid. It's actually an ellipse. Okay? And so each plane that you draw a circle will look slightly different, but that's the way that we draw a circle in isometric. Compasses won't work because it's not, an, not a true circle. You need to draw it by hand. So if you're comfortable drawing a circle by hand with four points and making it look neat based on where the tangents go, go nuts. If you want to do it a little bit more complicated, you can work out where the extra grid points are. Um, use that for homework if you're going to be real pedantic about circles. But this is the example that you're going to do on your page now. All right? You're going to draw this very simple cylinder. All right? And it is 30 mils in diameter and 60 mils long. What is the first thing that we do? Box it out. How big is my box? It will be... Uh, so if you're talking in number of triangles, it'll be 6 by 6 by 12. But if you've got a ruler, it will be 30 by 30 by 60. Okay? That is the first thing you do. Fit it up as high as you can and out of the way so you can fit as many things on your page as you can. And then we're going to draw the circle on the small face of it. And then we're going to draw the circle on the back face of it too. But we'll do that in a minute. Okay, so that's the box that I've drawn. Pretty easy, 30 by 30 by 60. Doesn't matter if you go back into the page to the right or back into the page to the left. Show of hands who went the same way as me. Show of hands who went the opposite way. Yeah, kind of, a, most of them, most of you went my way and I think that's largely because the way it's drawn is the circle on the left. So it sort of makes sense to draw it kind of in that configuration. Either way, it's completely right. You just might get a little bit caught up. All right, so obviously with our centre points, we take 15, 15, 15, and 15 at the front. And then you need it at the back as well because we have to draw that curve side too. So we'll draw a little box at the back. 15, 15, 15, and 15. All right, so we've got... 
it parallel at each of those points and I'm going to draw a nice smooth circle with my wrist in the centre of the paper. Now, with these, these are an ellipse, so you'll see that the two parts of the circle that I'm about to draw, that's the tricky part. All right? That's the bit that is the real trick. If you get it right, it'll be a great looking circle. If you stuff it up a little bit or draw it a bit too straight, it'll look a bit wonky. The key is to pinch it up here. So it's an ellipse, so it actually goes up higher than you kind of think it does. So make sure that you're perpendicular or parallel to that line there and there and get up a little bit higher than you think it's going to go and then you'll get a good circle, maybe. Let's just wait until I draw something that's not crap first and then we'll... There we go, that's not too bad. So it still looks a little bit squashed, but that's completely appropriate. I don't, I don't mind that. As far as this subject's concerned, if it looks as squashed as mine, that's fine. All right, so we've got that on the front. We need one on the back too, and this will definitely be in construction mode because we're only going to use a little bit of it for the actual drawing. So you don't really need this bit down the bottom here, but I'll draw it anyway, just for practice. And this bit down here. And then we've got our kind of pinched bit at the top and the pinch bit at the bottom. Right, so now I've got a circle on the front and the back and I join the outermost edge, which is here, for the top of my cylinder and I draw the bottom edge, join that up, make sure it's at 30 degrees. Alright, and that's my cylinder. And now if I really wanted to, I could darken now I'm just going to do this real messy so that you can see which lines I'm darkening. But you can darken the, darken the lines that you actually see at the front, which is that line, that line, and then only this part of the circle that's on the outside like that, yeah? So obviously your darkening will be perfectly ruler drawn and whatnot, but this is just to highlight which lines, which lines you're going to make dark. Make sense? It's a bit shiny. Right, so those are the lines you would draw in pen and then you would rub the rest of it out and that would be what you would see if you held the cylinder up and imagined it in isometric. Is everyone starting to get comfortable with circles? All right? No. Circles are difficult, right? It gets more difficult when you need to draw a half circle. All right? A half circle is just this. You draw it exactly the same except your grid only allows you half. And what I see time and time again is people going, I need a half circle, 30 by 30, and joining it up. All right, that's not a half circle or a semicircle. In this context, half would be 15 by 30. And that box, and you start at the bottom corner, go up to the middle, and come back to the bottom corner. All right? It's exactly what you just did then, only half. You, don't, you only need to draw this line, perhaps, and this line. Yeah? So, for the example that I showed here, this part, this hole at the back, that's a full circle. And the first thing this person's done is draw a big box where the circle's going to go and then put the dots on it. So a construction box, dots for the circle, and then actually drawn that circle. All right? Now this, this part here is half a circle with two straight lines. So you draw your straight lines and then you box out your half circle if you want. This person hasn't, but that's okay. You could draw a little box there and that little box is two wide by one high and you draw your little isometric circle, making sure you've got your three points there. All right? It's just practice, guys. It's really pretty simple once you do a couple of these. Isometric drawing is great for sketching in group work. All right? Okay, so that's circles. Um, I'll just mention curves quickly because curves are just the same as circles and straight lines in so much as you translate the grid. In some circumstances you'll have to make a grid. Alright, so let's say let's say we have that 
let's say it's six by four. All right, and that's the curve I want to translate to my isometric drawing. All you do is grid it up, right? So you come up with a point there, a point there, let's say a point there, a point there. And then those are the points you translate to your ISO grid. Doesn't matter, it's pretty arbitrary which points you choose. If I've got four by six back, All right, that's up one, up one. This is up two, up two, that's where I go. This one, the next one is up two and a half, two and a half. The next one's a bit higher than two and a half, and this is as accurate as I really need to be. A bit more than halfway along there. One and a half up. So you could be a bit more systematic about this, one and a half up, but this is fine for the context of sketches, certainly, and most drawings that you do. If I was doing this with a ruler, and then remembering our tangents and things. All right, now I have a curved line and isometric, right? It's as simple as that. If you want to do it more accurately, you can measure out every single one of those points and you can work out where all the tangent points are. So, for example, I can identify that that's a horizontal there, that's a horizontal there, and that's a horizontal there, and I can actually pick those points in space and make sure that they're parallel to the, wherever that was, parallel to the grid, but otherwise it's all of the same things you did with diagonals and circles just at a, a larger grid scale. Okay? So the entire game is you have a grid, translate a 2D into a 3D shape, but it's exactly the same grid, it's just a skewed grid with 30 degree angles in it, but you pretty much do exactly that. Okay? Um, exactly the same technique can be used for the oblique ones, so the ones at 45 degrees. Stick a grid on it, do the same thing. You can get 45 degree paper as well. Same thing can be done for perspective. So you can just create your own perspective grid and draw it and translate it. So this grid technique is kind of the system. The system is take a 2D and put it into a 3D, but front face, top face, side face, it's all pretty much the same. You just draw it on there. Okay? All right. So I've got two examples. One you're going to do now is number three, bottom left. There's the other three examples there that you can do for homework. And I've got this example as well, which you guys can do for homework as it gets more complicated. And we'll do one about this difficult, maybe two this difficult, uh, in the tutorial tomorrow. So feel free to use this for study tonight because there will be isometric on the test and there will be isometric tomorrow. All right, but what we're going to do now just in the last part of this lecture, while you're still here and you're able to ask me questions, is this one. So draw your box around it, find the places for the circle hole, the semicircle and that angle, and put everything that I just said into practice while I'm here to ask me questions about it. Cool? So go. Sorry? Uh, the top one's the... What do we say? Let's say the top... This is... This is a top view, and this is a front view. So you can probably configure that if that's four high, three deep. Let's say your box is four high. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight back that way, and it goes three back that way. Right? So this front circle is going to be over here. You're going to have this angle on there and so forth. Make sense? Clear as mud. Excellent. Have a go. All right, everyone knows that this dashed line here, we'll talk about in the next lecture, those that don't, a dashed line like this indicates hidden detail. What that means is this hole basically goes through this whole thing. So anything that you can't actually see on the front plane but you want to indicate in your drawing, you're doing a dashed line. And then these long dashed dot lines indicate the centre plane of a circle. So if you've got a hole, you go down the whole axis. And if you've got a hole on the front, you do dot dash, dot dashed as a, a hex pattern identifying the centre point of that circle. 
We'll talk about that next week. All right, so hopefully everyone's got a four by eight by three type box. So three by eight by four. Um, and if you're going to do the diagonal at the back there, that is one in. So let's draw the top, top view, which is this. The only feature on the top view is that diagonal. So one in, two in. So one in that way. Two in that way, or two back both ways. And I draw that on the top. I can draw the same thing on the bottom. One, two. All right. And then I join up my bits in my left view and my line from my right view. And there I have my diagonal at the back side. So most of you are getting pretty close to drawing the circles. So we technically have two semicircles and two full circles that we need to draw. All right, so two being a full circle and a semicircle at the front side and both of those at the back side. All right, so let's position the box around our circle and our points. Our circle is four or two in radius. So we come back two centimetres down two centimetres, that's the centre. And that's one point, that's one point, and that's one point of our big one. That's on the front face, and let's go to the back face. Centre, one, two, bottom, one, two, right face. And I can even box that out if I really feel like I need to. Like so. Alright, so we can draw our large circle first if you wish. We only need half of it, so this bit's the easier one to draw. Like so. And then I need my kind of pinched bit at the front. Like so. And then I come up with a tangent against those two edges for the top. And then I have my circular end part for the two half circles. Now I need a box around the little circles. And to me, that looks, maybe it's one by one. I think it's a little bit more than one by one. So this is purely approximation for you guys. But we know where the centre is. So it's a little bit more than, let's say 0.75 in radius. That'll do me. If you've done something like that or similar, that's fine. Same here, 0.75 in radius. Now, you're welcome to draw a box around that if you like, if that helps you. Like that, just to get your tangents. But if you're happy with the, the tangents on each of those sections being in that direction, straight up and down, that direction, straight up and down, you can just draw it. Now, I'm going to draw this. I'm going to be lazy and draw those like that, which is the wrong way to draw it, obviously. All right, there's my front circle. Do I see any part of the rear circle in its current position? Nope, so I don't need to draw it, unless I'm doing hidden detail on an isometric and I don't expect you to do hidden detail on an isometric unless I expressly ask for it. All right. Anyone that doesn't know what hidden detail is, you'll learn about that next week. But those of you that do and are comfortable with these drawings, generally speaking, we don't have hidden detail in an isometric unless it's absolutely necessary to understand what the features are. And I'll ask for it specifically. So have I drawn everything, everyone? Yeah, with the exception of rubbing out some lines and making some lines nice and neat and dark pen, I've got everything I need here. Obviously, this line here won't exist because I'll do a nice dark line around there like that, um, this one along here like that, and dark that in. But otherwise, I have everything I need. If I did it in pencil, it would be a lot easier. Okay? So, 
There are three other examples on this page in the notes so you guys can have a crack at. I'll put some of that ISO paper up online too if you want to print it out. And then there's this one. Now this one is recreate the isometric drawing below, but this time section it using a vertical cutting plane centred on the 22 diameter holes. So what that means is if I cut it, what am I looking at? Everyone looking at my arm? If I cut it like this, Okay, so that's a 22 diameter, 22 mil diameter hole. That's a 22 diameter hole. So I'm chopping it this way down. All right, so I would have a cutting plane, if you can see my cursor, that goes up, back, up, across, down a bit, across that diagonal a little bit, up, back, down, and through that hole. And I want you to draw the back half of it. Okay? Now that's a really good isometric homework question because there's more complexity there, particularly around where that diagonal meets that cutting plane. Chances are you probably need to draw this point and join it up or something like that to get that diagonal right. Okay? So use that for homework because we're going to do something like that in the tube. Not this one obviously, but something about this complicated. So the more practice you get, the better. Cool? Otherwise, have a good afternoon.